ELC family and friends, welcome back to Midweek Online. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, glad that you are here. Please make plans to be with us this Sunday. It's Dedication Sunday. It's going to be a great day at TLC. Well, tonight we are continuing uh, our next to last lesson in our fourth module talking about uh, apostolic elements, uh, laying a foundation for a Christian lifestyle, and we've been talking about holiness the last several weeks. Uh, we've talked about living, what it means to live a counterculture life, displaying the fruits of the Spirit in our lives, and and last week was talking about having a holy heart, making sure that we are pursuing holiness with our motives, our intentions, and, and make sure the position of our heart is right. And tonight, uh, we are going to talk about holy habits uh, and letting the holiness that is in our heart come out and be reflected in our lifestyle. As we seek to live a way that pleases God and get closer to Him, He'll help us to be holy in what we see or what we watch, in what we hear or what we listen to, and what we wear. Outside of the scope of this lesson and outside of your book, I, I would even go so far to say that other senses of our five senses are involved in our holiness, right? We don't talk about it a lot, but it's true that God wants us to be holy in what we smell or taste. And, and, and the word talks about gluttony. We want to make sure that we are taking care of, of the temple of God, if you will, our bodies. And, and so in everything that we do, in all of our life, we want to make sure that we are holy and pleasing to God. Uh, in our books tonight, if you're following along, the author says that God desires that we live a holy life. And while some hear that and believe that it means that we have to live a perfect life without error, that's not the case. You see, God gives us David in the Old Testament as a great example of holiness. A great example in the fact, um, and he calls him a man after God's own heart. You see, David is a man with many mistakes in his life, but he also serves as a cautionary tale, reminding us that we must establish habits in our life that lead to holiness. We see this setting, David's activity of strolling on the roof was innocent in the story of, of David and Bathsheba. And he, he takes a stroll out on the roof and that's part of normal activity, part of his daily routine, if you will, and nothing is wrong with that. But the reason that we have holiness in our life, the reason that we have certain principles that we live by is because our everyday activities sometimes lead to unexpected places. You see, David ends up seeing a woman bathing and, and he ends up murdering her husband. When you think about that, you think for a minute, wait a minute, he sees a woman bathing on the rooftop and he murders her husband. Think about how many wrong turns, bad decisions, and poor choices were made from something that could have been innocent mistake to committing murder. Therein lies the key to holiness. The first look wasn't the problem. He had options to look away. He could have said, oh my goodness, I shouldn't have seen that. God, forgive me. Instead, he asked about the woman invites Bathsheba to his palace, initiates a relationship, commits, commits sexual immorality, and then finds himself pulling deeper and deeper down a path he never intended to walk that day that he first took that stroll out on the rooftop, part of his daily routine. But he didn't have the principles of holiness guarding his heart, his mind, and his eyes. That brings us to our first point, our first part of our lesson tonight, in pursuit of holiness in what we see or what we watch. The author says what we watch has the power to affect what we tolerate and even accept as normal. Followers of Jesus pursue holiness in media choices and all we take in visually. Your blanks there are accept media and visually. You know, here at the end of 2020, this is more true than it ever has been with social media all the rage and everyone constantly putting things in front of their eyes and their phones and their tablets and their computers and, of course, on their televisions. We need to make sure that we have holiness principles guiding what we watch 
in what we see. Psalms 101 and verse 3, the psalmist says, I will refuse to look at anything vile and vulgar. I hate all who deal crookedly, and I will have nothing to do with them. You see, we have a choice in what we see. We have a choice in what we watch. Who wrote the Psalms, Psalm 101? Yes, it was David. It was David, and you can rest assured that that psalm was ringing in his head over and over again. You see, the word wicked here in the scripture can be translated also as worthless. So how how can spending too much time watching worthless content hurt us as Christians in multiple ways, and it's in direct opposition to Philippians 4 and 8, which tells us whatsoever things are lovely, just, noble, virtuous, and praiseworthy, think on these things. We got to ask ourselves every time we turn on the television, every time we pick up our phone and we scroll to YouTube or or scroll down the Facebook watch feed or or Instagram or, or your media of choice, ask yourself, am I living by holiness principles and the things that I'm looking at, are they lovely and noble and just and virtuous and praiseworthy? Last question we're asking this section, what are practical ways you can pursue holiness and choices about what we watch? You see, what's so important about what we watch is what we continually put in front of our eyes begins to dictate and change our mindset about the things that we consider as normal. What we consider as acceptable, the things that, that we may feel that was once was immoral or violent, we, we can take in enough content that we think, oh, well, I've watched much worse than that. I've watched much worse than that. See, if you don't see the fact that Hollywood puts out more and more ungodly, corrupt material, at the same time our culture is becoming more and more ungodly and corrupt, then My friend, you're simply closing your eyes to the obvious. Along with what we watch, what we see, our second part of our lesson tonight is we need to pursue holiness and have holiness principles about what we hear or what we listen to. The author says what we listen to can affect how we think and feel. And as followers of Jesus who want our thoughts and emotions anchored in him and his word, we should monitor what we hear. Listen, anchored, and monitored are your blanks in that section. 1 Samuel chapter 16, a long portion of scripture to read, illustrate what we're talking about. Beginning in verse 17, All right, Saul said, find me someone who plays well and bring him here. One of the servants said to Saul, one of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem is a talented harp player. Not only that, but he's a brave warrior, a man of war, and has good judgment. He's also a fine-looking young man. The Lord is with him. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse to say, Send me your son David, the shepherd. Jesse responded by sending David to Saul along with a a young goat and a donkey loaded with bread and wineskin full of wine. So David went to Saul and began serving him. Saul loved David very much, and David... Uh, became his armor bearer, and then Saul sent word to Jesse, Please let David remain in my service, for I am very pleased with him. Now listen to verse 23. And whenever the tormenting spirit from God troubled Saul, David would play the harp, then Saul would feel better, and the tormenting spirit would go away. Before we look at these questions that we're asking our lesson tonight. I I want to illustrate here, and we're going to repeat it throughout this section, talking about what we listen to. Music is so powerful that a tormenting spirit from God Almighty was stopped and was driven away, if you will, through the power of music. A spirit sent by God was controlled or stopped by music. Our first question, what qualified David to be the musician for the king? Verse 18 says he was brave and good judgment. The Lord was with him. Our second question is, does music really have an effect on our minds? In verse 23, it said that it had the power to affect spirits that we entertain. Again, it had the power over a spirit sent from 
God. How did music affect Saul's anger? In verse 23, it said it soothed his anger. What are practical guidelines for what we hear? We could go back to Philippians 4.8. Use the same things that we talked about with what we see or what we watch. Things that are noble and just, praiseworthy. You know, unfortunately, too many Christians use the simple excuse, well, the lyrics to that song is okay, Pastor. I've heard that over and over again. You, you better have enough spiritual discernment to recognize the spirit of the band and the singers behind the music. You need to ask yourself, what's the mood of the song? Is it a rebellious mood? Is it a lustful mood? Is the message clear? Does it support or very least not at least not contradict godly principles found in the Word of God? You know, when we talk about what we watch and what we hear, we're often quick to say, well, there's much worse out there. I'm reminded of a story about my grandfather, my dad's dad, and I've heard it many times throughout my life, but I think it it rings really, really to what we're talking about tonight. If I remember the story right, you know, years ago they went to Branson, Missouri, and they were on a family vacation, and they were taking Papa Copeland to see a family entertainment show in Branson, Missouri. Perfectly innocent, perfectly fine for, for the family to watch and see. And as they sat there watching that show, I remember they said one of my dad's siblings looked down at my papa and he was nervously sitting on the edge of a seat tapping his foot. And they asked him, Dad, what's, what's wrong? And he says, my goodness, I can't believe I'm sitting here. I hope the good Lord doesn't return while I'm watching this mess. I might as well be watching Elvis Presley. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I kind of laugh and chuckle when I hear that story. You know, the truth is we have a lot of Christians today that think about music like Elvis Presley. Here in 2020, we think, well, that was the golden oldies and that was just some good old music and we, we fire that up and we listen to it. But, but back in the day when Elvis was making headlines, if you will, and, and he was topping all the charts, the Christians of the day of that age would say that, oh, that was, that was horrible music and a Christian shouldn't listen to that. But because we've gotten used to it, and because there's much worse out now, doesn't seem that bad. Am I telling you that listening to Elvis is going to send you to hell? No, but what I'm telling you is, just because there's something worse to watch, just because there's something worse to listen to, doesn't always make what you're watching and listening to okay according to the Word of God. We don't need to use the culture as a standard. We don't need to use society as a standard, other entertainment, other media options as a standard. We need to use the Word of God as our standard to say, is this just? Is this noble? Is this trustworthy? Is this praiseworthy? And you see the idea of what we hear doesn't just apply to songs and music. We can apply it to our conversations. Make sure that what we hear from our friend group and the circles and the people that are around us, make sure that, that it's godly. Make sure that it aligns with the Word of God. We need to ask ourselves in our pursuit of holiness, do we entertain and support godly or ungodly relationships? Do we surround ourselves with people that treat others the way the Scriptures say to treat them? Or do we sit around and talk about and listen to gossip and tales about other people that are in our church or in our society, in our friend group, in our culture, in our neighborhood? Are we, are we gossips and do we, do we run our mouth and listen to things about others that we shouldn't? Then we're not living very holy. The last two points of our lesson tonight as I hurry along is talking about holiness in our appearance holiness in what we wear. The author says, since our purpose is to point others to Jesus Christ, we should consider our appearance as part of our commitment to holiness. The New Testament is consistent in calling for modest apparel. So the mature believer seeks to adorn themselves accordingly. 1 Peter 
chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, Peter says, Don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourself instead with a beauty that comes from within, an unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. We're asked some questions about this scripture. What's precious to God? A gentle and a quiet spirit. How should we adorn, adorn ourselves with beauty that comes from within? What can get in the way of a meek and quiet spirit that we are cultivating according to verse 3? Emphasis on the exterior and or outward beauty. That can get us messed up if we focus on that too much. The author asks, why do we think the world bases the value of people on superficial appearance? We see it all the time when, you know, when Adam and Eve recognized their nakedness, they covered themselves with fig leaves, we're told in the book of Genesis. Then God comes along and he is the one that gave them animal skins. We can learn and take away from that that his desire, God's desire for our life always goes beyond the bare minimum. You see, truth is in multiple conversations I've had around the topic of modesty has led me to land to certain places in my, my thinking and view of the scripture. And I find it interesting that people are quick to get upset when when it's pointed out that the Word of God discusses our attire. As born-again believers, we have Scripture in the New Testament written to you and me as New Testament born-again believers. There are Scriptures that talk about how we should dress and how we should appear to other people. But the people that don't want to talk about that, the people that get upset about the words of the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul, they're the same people who, who don't mind dressing business casual for the office and for the job. After all, pastor, that's for a paycheck and my office requires that, that I wear khakis and that I wear a button-down shirt. I have to do that because business casual is the dress code for my office. Okay, so you're willing to do it for the paycheck. Okay. Some other people are, you know, they get mad about the Bible talking about dressing a certain way, but they don't mind them wearing certain attire to that five-star restaurant. It's a black tie required. Make sure you go in there to eat that fine meal. You have to be dressed a certain way. Or to go out to Bass Hall and, and take in a nice concert or, or a nice theater, a nice show there in Bass Hall, downtown Fort Worth. You have to dress a certain way to go. You see, many places in our country require a dress code. Even 7-Eleven. For those of you who think, well, Pastor, I don't go to you know, Bass Hall. I don't go to five-star restaurants. That's not my style. Well, if you go into 7-Eleven right there on the door, it says no shoes, no shirt, no service. Most other convenience stores do too. So if the person going to buy a pack of cigarettes and a case of beer at midnight, if they have a way that they have to dress, then why are born-again believers so quick to dismiss the words written by two great apostles who both took the time to talk about modesty and our appearance. See, what we wear also has great substance and reflects and addresses the last part of our lesson tonight, and that is gender distinction. In addition to Scripture's instruction about modesty for dress, mature and believers should seek to reflect our God-given gender in our appearance. As we celebrate being made in the image of God, we dress and present ourselves with gender distinction. 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 8, the Apostle Paul, talking to his young protege, Timothy, he says, In every place of worship, I want men to pray with holy hands, lifted up to God, and free from anger and controversy. And I want women to be modest in their appearance. They should wear what's decent and appropriate clothing and not draw attention to themselves by the way they fix their hair or by wearing gold or pearls or expensive clothes. For women who claim to be devoted to God should make themselves attractive by the good things they do. Don't, so be, don't be too quick to take the words of the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter and try to explain them away by this is uh, the culture and society for, for something that was written 2,000 years ago. The whole Bible falls 
under that statement. The whole Bible falls under the fact that it was written 2,000 years ago. And just because we don't like certain things written in the Bible, we don't want to excuse each and everything that, well, that was talking about something for that day and age. My friend, the New Testament is written to New Testament believers, to born-again believers, the way to heaven described in the book of Acts and described in John chapter 3, described in Acts chapter 19. That was written 2,000 years ago. That's applicable to day as is everything in the New Testament. All the words of God are inspired by the Holy Spirit and is used for correction, instruction for you and me today. The author of our lesson asks, what are men called to do to live holy? In verse 8, be free from anger and controversy. The second question is, how are women called to adorn themselves? Verses 9 and 10 tells us with good things that they do. And what scripture cautions, what it cautions us against in verse 9, using clothing to draw attention to ourselves. What word does scripture use to describe ideal apparel? In verse 9, it says decent and appropriate. You see, the truth is we can find that holiness has much more to do than much more to do with our behavior as it does with the way we look. You see, pursuing holiness draws us closer to to God pleasing him rather than pleasing the culture around us in our appearance in our behaviors in our actions and reactions we should seek to please God so here's the truth those of you who find yourself thinking that well I am modest and I'm holy and there's not a uh, immodest outfit in my closet but your tongue as long as the freeway and you're dicing up other people over dinner every night, you're not holy. It's about what's inside. It's about what's coming out of your mouth. It's about what's going in your eyes, in your ears. It's about how we dress. It's about our entire lifestyle, church. Those of you maybe watching this that may not be part of the TLC family, I want to encourage you to study the Word of God. Understand that the Holy Spirit we are to be filled with it. We are to be led by it and operate in its power. And for that to happen, then it must affect every area of our life. Every area of our life. So, I want to encourage you tonight. If you're pursuing God, if you're reading the Word of God, if you're seeking to know more about God, Open your heart, open your mind to the fact that God wants to love you, wants to have a relationship with you, but he also desires that we live a life that's holy and a life that's pleasing to him. That is the pursuit of holiness. Well, I hope this has been a blessing to you tonight. Next week, we'll wrap this up, finish up our last lesson of our Module 4, and uh, we we look forward to seeing you this Sunday for Dedication Sunday. Everybody have a great night. Thanks. God bless.